Take back your soul. This is another transmission from Mahadeva here at ThunderWizard.com headquarters where you find the world's only unified spiritual energy system at ThunderWizard.com. Get ready because here I come. Hello YouTube, this is Mahadeva the Thunder Wizard and I want to continue our discussion, my analysis of the Vaishnava versus Shiva worshipping seeming divide and applying it to our experience of self-awareness evolution, our experience of divinity and um, yeah, it's, this is a deep subject that is really, I think, crucial for self-awareness. So before I go any further, this is uh, the main YouTube channel, the thunderwizard.com channel. All of these links are here for you. If you're new to this channel, please go and check them out. The 90 day challenge, uh, the thunderwizard.com site is the most advanced energy system I've come across and I offer it to you. It's also the main way that uh, you support this channel. I don't ask for donations. I don't believe in that. I believe in exchange of energy. So if you want to support this channel, go do some work. You can go check out courses.thunderwizard.com. If you want the elite, most powerful energy practice in my experience in the world, go here. Maoshan.thunderwizard.com. All right. So let us continue with this discussion. I just had a thought that popped into my head, which isn't exactly related, but I want to share it with you because I think it's profound and I don't want to forget it, which is that the point of human existence is evolution. The point of human existence is evolution, which means that we are not meant to have a dead static existence. And unfortunately, that's what happens to all of us when we are in pain and we seek spirituality as a way to escape that pain. What we're really looking for is we want a respite. And um, my suggestion is instead of seeking to get rid of conflict or challenges that we find the appropriate pathway to evolution, seeking evolution, transformation to relieve the pressure of what this life brings. In other words, if we are not working towards a path of self-awareness and evolution, the challenges that are meant to drive us to that can um, be debilitating. So it's not the ceasing of challenges. It is knowing which way to flow with them so that you will evolve. Um, anyway, so I just thought I'd throw that out there. So we're looking over here at this uh, picture of Mahadeva. Interesting that uh, he's sitting there next to the moon because Mahadeva is the lunar vibration of Shiva. And he's holding a three-pronged, whatever the heck that is. Um, but the, that represents the three selves. So as you know, if you follow my channel, Human beings are not one thing. We are a community of consciousnesses. You have all of the cells in your body, all of the nervous system. You have the spinal column. You have the kundalini consciousness. You have the soul consciousness. You have your chi. You have the three centers, which is the navel center, the heart center, and the third eye, which is what is one of the representations of that three-pronged, whatever the heck that is that he's carrying. Um, but that's why he carries that because that is where he's bringing us. He represents evolution and evolution is the fusion of all three. Now, all of us are on different levels of our awakening as souls. Make no mistake, we reincarnate by choice because we are choosing to evolve in greater consciousness and awareness. That is the whole point. And so blaming it on God or blaming it on fate, there's only one person to blame for your, uh, your manifestation. It's you. 
If you didn't want to come here, you wouldn't be here. It is true that part of the illusion is that it feels as though it happened to you. But that is one of the lessons that you have to learn. I mean, for me, the most powerful lesson in human existence is the knowledge of full responsibility. Like I had a, I had a childhood that I wouldn't wish on anybody. Some of you have had <clears throat> worse than me, so I'm not com I'm not competing with anybody. But um, the the most I can say the single most powerful uh, attitude that I adopted was when I was in my late teens, early twenties, and you have no idea what I was going through. But I came to the conclusion that it was in my best interest to take full responsibility that everything I had in my life, I created. I didn't know how I did that because on paper, you know, uh, what I went through, I didn't deserve, you know, little babies born into the world don't deserve some of the crap that they have to go through as children. But I found that it, from a practical standpoint, any other attitude was not going to work that I knew that if I took full responsibility, then I would find a way out. And so I share that with you. And that is the message of human existence. That is the message of karma, that you take full responsibility for everything, even if you don't know how you created what you have in your life. That attitude will preserve your life, literally. I mean that in every way possible. Okay, I just got chill saying that. So somebody has given me the thumbs up on that. All right, so let us continue with this discussion. So I shared with you yesterday the interesting um, astrological associations with the different avatars of Vishnu. And we talked, uh, we used Krishna as one of the uh, focal points. So Krishna... Did you know there are 10 avatars of Vishnu? And again, Vishnu is of the three, you know, in the human body, Vishnu is the soul. Vishnu is the soul in the body, period, end of discussion. But we are not just the soul. We are a higher self and we are a lower self. We are the unconscious subconscious, which is the lower self. We are the soul, which is the focus of experience which is merged with our our heart emotions and then we have the third eye which is uh, associated with intellect on the on the gross physical level but it's associated with awareness and discernment going beyond the duality this is the up here is about going past the duality when your focus is here you are enmeshed the heart enmeshes the lower self is about attachment because in order to be created, you must first be attached. So creation, um, people want to manifest. I mean, that's if you want to know what manifestation is associated with the three selves, it's the lower self. If you're really into wanting to manifest, if you're into Western magic, black magic, you are all lower self. Nothing wrong with that. There's a lot to be learned there. In terms of the deities... In the Vedic tradition, as we've said, uh, this is reflected in just about everywhere you look. But in the, the East Indian tradition, that's probably a more accurate way of putting it, there is the uh, god Brahma, which is the creator. There is, and Brahma, by the way, used to be it. Brahma used to be God. Brahma, and then there's Vishnu, and then there's Shiva. Those are the three deities and these are definitely associated, even though you may not hear it <clears throat> from Hindus. They may realize it, they may not. Uh, I am here as a syncretist. I am here to syncretize these things, not make things up or, you know, project onto things. My goal as a scientist, a spiritual scientist, is to find how all of these things come together. And we syncretize the same knowledge, the same spiritual science and other traditions and we find where they reflect, where they agree and where and where they complement each other. And so we know that Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu represent the three selves. Uh, so we talked about 
the seeming war between the Vishnu worshippers and the Shiva worshippers. When Shiva, uh, one of the names of Shiva is Mahadeva, which means the great deity. And so people will say, no, he's Mahadeva. He is the great. He is the highest deity. And then people will say, no, it's Vishnu, because Vishnu is the source. Um, all deities are created by Vishnu. Vishnu is God. And so there's, there's a practical difference between the two, which is one is God consciousness. In fact, ISKCON, you know, the Hare Krishnas, they will talk about Krishna consciousness and interchange that with God consciousness. They talk about God a lot in the, exactly the same way that Christians talk about Jesus or God the Father. They talk about worshiping God. They talk about being worthy of God. They talk about sacrificing your physical desires. There's a lot of talk. You know, if you listen to a Krishna uh, guru, they will talk a lot about the lower nature of the physical self, the physical desires and how, you know, they're beyond that. And that the greatest desire is that for God, for Krishna, and that you should focus completely on that. Um, I find it interesting because Krishna is polyamorous. So Krishna represents the beloved of the soul. And um, in his mythology, he is, he, you know, he's, he's attractive. In fact, one of, the, one of the definitions of Krishna means attractive. So he attracts people. What's the thing about attraction? It's never, it never satisfies. You know, that's why it's why porn is so popular. It never satisfies. It's not like you have that find that one perfect sexual experience. OK, I'm done. No, it just creates more desire. So what's ironic is that Krishna himself creates intense desire in his devotees. And as a follower of Krishna, in fact, you are you are encouraged to worship only Krishna. You are encouraged to love only only Krishna. Krishna, on the other hand, um, can love whoever the heck he wants. He can, he's, he has, he has multiple, multiple wives, but each one of his wives only is allowed to love him, or they only desire him. And so it creates uh, a desire that never truly gets fulfilled, which is the bliss of it all. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> unrequited love. Love stories, the thing about love stories, if they're popular, it's always unrequited. Because uh, lo requited love, where somebody loves you back, gets boring really quick. How do you want to figure out how? Go get married. Well, you get married, you know, you've, you love each other completely, the devotion is there, and all of a sudden it becomes about dealing with bodily smells and uh, lack of makeup and... Uh, you know, leaving your, your hair all over the toilet and not leaving the toilet seat up. And uh, did you put the, the toilet paper going in the right direction? And um, why are there dishes in the sink? And who's going to take out the trash? And that's what marriage is about. It's about, you know, two humans in their, you know, living together. And that's why we don't watch any, any movies about that. We watch movies like in uh, Titanic, perfect example they they're star-crossed lovers of different uh social tiers and they find themselves in this in this uh you know out uh, the isolation of being in the middle of the ocean on the ship and what is what happens the guy dies he lets go and he sinks down to the to the briny cold depth and she's left with her the what if unrequited love it's really narcissistic it's really selfish but that's what we love the the intensity of the you know it's and again sex is a good example it's amazing it's amazing it's amazing until you reach blast off and then you're bored and you're like all right well anyway i gotta go it's nice meeting you but uh yeah i gotta go yeah, yeah, you go. I have stuff I got to do. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I'll text you. I'll call you. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to be busy the next week, but yeah. 
it's uh you know that's what we don't want to get to that place we want to stay in the part up until right up until that the fevered pitch of almost having the perfect and then when you get it you go oh, oh uh, all right that's krishna krishna is unrequited love the ecstasy the narcissistic and it's just i'm just being realistic here the narcissistic experience of ecstasy of almost completely merging with the other krishna keeps you right on there you know he, he keeps you he's uh he's an <laughs> he's an orgasm denier <laughs> keeps you right on the edge never really lets you you know but that's that is the lesson i my personal belief is the karmic lesson for krishna worshipers is that's the lesson because here's my experience i'm just going to be straight with you my experience of krishna worshipers is that they strike me as people who are who are learning the lessons to transform beyond codependence the irony is that they are completely devoted to krishna i'm lowering myself and yet they come across very uh i'm trying not to say anything negative but you know the the you know i was just clicking around and saw a krishna guru and you know his youtube channel his opening video is him in uh you know the craze of ecstasy as they're chanting uh, krishna's name and he's decked out in his giant throne covered with uh covered with flowers as they're washing his feet he's obviously he has taken on the the personification of krishna and they're worshiping him and so it's it's ironic that the whole thing is about you're supposed to deny yourself lower yourself before krishna but those who teach it end up wanting and loving all of that attention and they have the answer you know i i could should i read from this guy i'm not going to give his name but should I read from his his uh, his self-described bio? So and so, this is a uh, uh, Krishna uh, guru. So and so is initiated disciple of his divine grace. You know, some other guy. One of the most elevated spiritual masters in world history. So and so has been blessed by his spiritual master with the formula of how every individual on this planet can achieve unlimited happiness happiness within his heart by spiritual awakening and how the entire planet can be transformed into a beautiful garden of eden like atmosphere by everyone becoming reconnected in a symbiotic relationship with that supreme person who is the source of our existence that is an excellent encapsulation of the experience of the heart-centered Vishnu devotee. And as I said before, this is the heart center. The heart center is um, wanting to connect. And ironically, the desire to connect is a way of getting out of your own isolation. It's a way of getting out of your own narcissism but the first step of that is narcissistic projection so all of the projection on there the projection is i have found the thing that gives me bliss therefore every single other person in the world the logical extension of i have achieved this god consciousness is that everybody else has to have this same experience and so my experience with people who are really Vishnu worshipers, there's an irony there of projection of their narcissism. And it's very easy for these, you know, these, uh, these Vaishnava gurus to just indulge in being worshipped and treated like a god and, you know, all of the things associated with a cult. It's, I find it very ironic because... The whole teaching is you have to debase yourself and you have only you're nothing and God is everything. And I'm saying that that is a path for evolution. Because 
it is trying to get a childish, childish may not be the best word, an immature, you know, somebody who's learning, an immature understanding of self-awareness and self-experience and learning that it's not about projecting it on other people. So, and you know, God consciousness is other consciousness, which is good because children, you know, uh, toddlers, that's what toddlers need to do. One of the things you teach a toddler is that there's other people out there besides you. You can't just always demand attention. You must share, you must give. And so I found that a lot of Krishna worshipers can be very childish and uh, immature and selfish in that way because they project on you. They, they, it's very presumptuous. They presume their path is your path. They, they, um, you know, they have the grandiosity. Little kids are grandiose. They have the grandiosity. Our path is better than yours. My God is the true God. And every other God, oh, well, that's because they, you know, all of that stuff. And we're going to get into that. Uh, we're going to discuss that a little further. And then, um, but the irony is, is that that is the path to learn. But the only way to learn is you have to, you have to experience where you are. And if you are self-absorbed, grandiose, and immature, then the way out of that is to fulfill that. And the way you fulfill that is by projecting onto Krishna what you want for yourself, which is complete attention. This is just the human condition. Complete attention, complete devotion, and yet, what Krishna does brilliantly is he stays just out of reach. He stays just out of reach because you have to experience that. You know, as I say, enlightenment, as I gave in the recent uh, video lecture, I said there's three aspects to enlightenment. There is the state of enlightenment. There is the path of enlightenment. And then there is the goal of enlightenment. So... Uh, to, in order to get to that, the, the state of enlightenment, as I teach, I guess I should encapsulate the whole three, because I think it's a great teaching and I want to remember it. Um, so the state of enlightenment is anybody, no matter at what level of evolution they're at, can be in a state of enlightenment. State of enlightenment is when you have all of your thoughts and all of your feelings, all of your impulses, all of your desires. You have all of them without any judgment, positive or negative, pleasant or unpleasant. You do not sublimate them. You do not push them down. You become completely aware. And this is the brilliance of Krishna. Krishna puts you in a state of narcissism without any of the negativity. So... And what's really going on, if you want to know why you, we think that, uh, you know, dogmatic cult members are narcissistic and why narcissists become dogmatic cult members is for this very reason. It's that Krishna is creating in these, I'm going to call them newer souls. Forgive me for the judgment, but that's how it comes across to me. What Krishna is doing for these younger souls is allowing them to completely experience their uh, non, listen to me very carefully, their non-toxic narcissism. So narcissism itself isn't toxic. Narcissism becomes toxic when, it does, when, when it's combined with other things associated with it, like uh, uh, shame, self-directed negativity, denial, then narcissism becomes a, an agent of uh, a, a, an unconscious, you know, uh, acting out of not having your narcissism fulfilled. A healthy child grows up to be a healthy adult because as a child, their narcissism was non-toxically fulfilled by their loving parents. It's only when children are not allowed their narcissism and they're shamed out of it that then they grow up in denial and they become toxic narcissists and they have no uh, empathy for others because empathy was not shown for them as, as children. 
So the brilliance of Krishna is that he allows his followers to have that toddler-like uh, narcissistic experience that they project onto Krishna. Make no mistake about it. When people are wiping the, the ceiling, when they're praising Jesus, when they talk about our God is a good God, I know that I know that I know that I know that our God is a good God. These are people who are seeking to experience their own narcissism and they're struggling against and potentially, you know, winning against the toxic shame. That's why they repeat, I know God is a good God. I know he's a good God. That's a projection of, I know I'm a good person. I know I'm worthy of love, even though they're having all of these negative doubts. So they debase themselves and they worship God. That is a projection. That's what they want. They want other people to debase themselves and to worship them and to love them and to give to them, which is why the irony is I'm watching this. I'm watching this, you know, and it's not unusual, but I'm watching this, this guru who's supposedly a self-realized uh, Krishna master as he's sitting on a throne covered in, ro in, in all kinds of flowers and people are chanting Hare Krishna and they are washing his feet and worshiping his feet. Now, you don't need to explain to me the symbolism. I get that. That's a whole other thing. What I find ironic is that if this guy's a spiritual master of debasing himself for the other, why is he... I mean, I would never let anybody do that to me. I would, I would never allow that. Not for me. I mean, I won't lie to you. I would enjoy that. If you want to, you know, you want to give me a bunch of attention, that's great. I would love that. You want to, but in a spiritual setting, it doesn't serve you. Unless there's a real awareness that what they're doing is there, you know, that's helping them move past that projection. But it's a projection. So that's the brilliance of Krishna is that he encourages this absolute, I mean, he's so attractive and, uh, you know, that his, his Gopalas, I think that's who they are. All of the female cow herders are just absolutely, completely, totally, just helplessly in love with him. There's a masochistic aspect of it, but it's not toxic. It's healing and transformative because that is what the immature child psyche needs to do. If that soul, and in my experience also, many people who are attracted, especially to Krishna worship, are people who came from very dysfunctional homes where there was a lot of narcissism and they have some really severe codependence. So they need, they, they, you know, their value is in how deeply they love God. And be, it's not toxic because it's not like you're, you're doing that to another limited human being that can never accept that and love that. Krishna accepts and loves and allows them their complete narcissistic projection onto him. And through that, they are transformed. Through that, they gain knowledge of the self. They first start by seeking knowledge of the other you know, Krishna consciousness, God consciousness. It's a very specific phrase. You don't hear it from uh, Shiva worshipers. Shiva worshipers don't talk about Shiva consciousness. I've never heard it. They don't talk about God consciousness. They talk about self-awareness and they talk about Shiva's self-awareness. They even have a mantra, Shiva hum. I am Shiva. I am self-awareness. So there's an identification Shiva is not the other. Shiva is you. And so, um, before we go uh, further, I, I want to take a look and uh, I want to analyze some comments. Again, guys, I love the comments. And I hope in this that I'm, not, I'm able to do this without hurting anybody's feelings. But when you take a self-righteous stance on my channel, and you're going to educate or correct, especially others. I mean, you know, I mean, correcting me is a bad idea. But when you're going to correct others in a, in, you know, a, you know, a presumptuous stance, 
if you're not right on the money, I'm going to let you know because I'm seeing somebody on my channel who's wanting to learn from what I'm doing. Um, I'm seeing potentially their own unconsciousness blocking their, uh, their awareness. And so I'm going to point it out to you. That's my job. I mean, listen, you know, the thing about Vishnu, we've got Vishnu is the preserver. And Krishna is great about this because you can be completely <laughs> narcissistic and even passive aggressive. You know, because I've, <laughs> Krishna worshipers, I find them to be very presumptuous, very grandiose, very naive and passive aggressive. But it's OK. It's sort of like, you know, as long as they're doing it through their spiritual practice, it's kind of OK. You know, it doesn't offend me. I, I, I've been to Kirtan, just to give you Kirtans, for example, like I teach mantra, but, you know, Ideally, mantra, self-awareness uh, practices, is you go off by yourself and you chant beneath your breath. That's one of the ways, according to some, that's the most powerful way. Chanting beneath the breath, chanting so that nobody sees you. You don't do it for that. Nobody knows that you're doing it. In fact, you're not even allowed to tell people which mantra you're doing because your ego will be stimulated. What is kirtan, which is, uh, you know, if you want to worship Krishna, you have to chant his mantra out loud and well, you can do it silently, but ideally you chant it in a group. And the last time I was in a kirtan, which was uh, led by Krishna devotees, they, you know, they give a little sermon ahead of time. And they, the sermon was how um, chanting in groups was the highest form of yoga. And they explained why that was. I'm okay with that because every form of yoga is the highest form of yoga. You know, if you don't know what that means, yoga isn't just stretching. That's hatha yoga, balancing the sun and the moon in the physical body. But there's bhakti yoga, which is devotion. There's karma yoga, which is doing actions to serve others. You know, there's raja yoga. There's, you know, there's all different kinds of yoga. Union, yoga means union, it comes from the same word we get in English of yoke, to yoke together. So um, a yogi isn't somebody who stretches and does postures. A yogi is somebody who has achieved union with the infinite. And so you go to a yogi to find union. Swami means, you know, ironically, you know, uh, Krishna devotees uh, call themselves Swami, the self. Maybe it's not all that ironic. Um, I forgot what I was saying, but it was very... <laughs> It was very profound, whatever it was. Um, anyway, so let me take a look at this. So I made the the video Shiva versus Vish, Vishnu, which one is the true God? I don't remember honestly what I said. Obviously, I lean more towards Shiva. It's obvious. I mean, that is my, you're hearing my perception, which creates my judgment that I find. The worship of God consciousness, the worship of the other, I find that to be a necessary path for souls that are, you know, making their way towards self-awareness. They haven't got there yet. So this is the most uh, powerful spiritual path for that, because that is their lesson and their experience in this life. And um, I, I find it really interesting, the whole idea, that as you look at it, the different avatars of Vishnu. Um, the avatar of Buddha is Mercury, which is the intellect, and the intellect cannot understand spiritual concepts. And what is one of the main discussions among Buddhists? Is there a soul? There is no soul. You know, um, that would be what Mercury would say. So here we have somebody trapped in their intellect, and they're achieving their awareness of infinity um, through the lens of Mercury. The lens of the moon, which is Krishna, the moon is the reflection. And that's what the moon is about. The moon is about reflecting the sun. Without the sun, the moon is dark. When the moon is dark, we have no energy. So if you're worshiping the moon aspect of uh, Vishnu, then your heart center is going to be uh, filled with the lust for connection to the infinite. And so it's always out of reach because the moon isn't the sun. 
we can look directly at the sun by looking directly at the moon. And please don't give me any of the sun gazers nonsense. For the rest of us mortals, we cannot look at the sun unaided. It's bad for our eyes. Um, so that's, that's, I find that interesting. If it's Mars, not a Simha, the irony with that is that Narasimha is Mars, and what does he do? He kills. Narasimha takes a, a man demon, takes him, puts him on his lap, and tears open his guts, and takes his entrails and wraps them around like a like a garland of necklaces. And when you worship Narasimha, the most furious aspect of Vishnu, my experience is love and compassion. When I worship Nara Simha, I have the most tender love and compassion feelings for others. There's the irony. So by me, if I worship Nara Simha, you know, because if I'm going to worship uh, Vishnu, it's going to be Nara Simha. If I worship Nara Simha, what's going to happen is I get to selfishly and narcissistically experience my rage which is really hiding pain, sadness. You know, you feel like you have to, you know, because that's the whole thing. Uh, uh, Prahalad, his whole goal is, you know, dad, just accept me for who I am. And dad doesn't. Dad, you know, tries to kill him. Dad says, you must worship me. And he says, I can't. I have to worship my own soul. I, my own soul has to come before you, dad. It's nothing personal. But if I really loved you, I, I wouldn't throw that away just to kiss your ass. You're not, you're not the ultimate. The ultimate is my soul, is Vishnu. And so um, the rage that we feel for not being seen and loved for who we are and the actual, the, the narcissistic abuse that we receive when that happens, it creates sadness and rage. Rage, anger, is a very important survival tool. Without anger, we wouldn't survive. So here we have Vishnu, the source of the universe of all peace and all, all you know, uh, love and bliss. And here he is, the embodiment of absolute rage. And so by worshiping Narasimha, I get to indulge in my narcissistic rage. And it's not toxic because the end result is it gives me nothing but tender compassion for those evil people. That's the end point. That's the irony of that. So the irony of those who worship Krishna is they get to work through their petulant narcissism uh, and their projection, uh, and they get to do that in a non-toxic way. Because you get a bunch of, uh, <laughs> a bunch of codependent, um, damaged, you know, which makes them more narcissistic, narcissistic um, codependent people in a room all chanting to one deity who stays just out of reach, who plays the flute and dances just out of reach, you get to fulfill that. And then you get to move beyond it. Um, so that's, so what we haven't talked about is Shiva. Shiva is not the other. Shiva is not God consciousness. Shiva is uh, awareness of the self. Shiva is what I would call individuation. And um, so what Vishnu worshippers want to say is that Shiva, oh, Shiva is the ultimate devotee, but he's not God. Yeah, Shiva, and, and they'll make a comparison. Shiva is, is, is not less than. Shiva is not superior. You know, that's important for them. They have to make that distinction. So anyway, I had my experience, which I shared, which I'm, of course, repeating in, uh, in ways now. And uh, somebody responded. And they say, when I read the Mahashiva Purana, so that is a scripture. So there's the Upanishads, there's the Puranas, there's the Vedas, there's a bunch of Hindu holy writings, the Vedas are the oldest, just to give you a background. on it. So she says, when I read the Mahashiva Purana, Shiva said, those who worship Vishnu worship me, and those who worship me worship Vishnu. So here you have an equality. You don't have an, uh, one is better than the other. You have, we're the same. 
In other words, let me give you an example. I wanted to start with this, but I forgot, but I'll do it now. When I was a kid, in fact, they have them here, so I don't know if you can see. Let me see. I'll try and show you uh, uh, on my thing here. So, okay, you can see it right there. You see that crystal chandelier over there? Right? It's not crystal. Anyway, you know, it's, you know what I'm talking about. So that thing right there. So we had one of those in our house, as everybody does, especially back in the 70s. And my mom, when she was cleaning the house, would, you know, they, there was little hooks and you would put the little crystal on the hook. She would take them off and she would polish them. And I can remember as a kid picking up one of those crystals and looking through it. And what I saw was a kaleidoscope of, of the whole room. So there was multiple pictures of the room, 10 or 20 different pictures of the room coming and, you know, my eye, you know, I was seeing all these, you know, I take it off. Nope, there's only one room here. I put the, the crystal up. There's 20 rooms. And so I found it interesting that, you know, from, and if I switched the angle, like if I looked at one and I, okay, there's that facet there. I want to see what it looks like through that facet. I turn around, I look through that facet and it would be the same thing. I would see the same room, Maybe instead of 20, there might be 10, you know. Um, but I came to the conclusion that, um, and I can't remember, I, it's amazing that I came to this conclusion as a little kid. Maybe it's not that amazing. Maybe it's amazing to me. But I came to this conclusion that, oh, this is a, a life that people, people, differing opinions and differing experiences is like looking through the crystal. And every single one of those facets sees the truth in its own way. And each one of those facets comes together. You can find the truth uh, by following any one of these facets. You'll get to the same place. And so I brought that into later on my idea of differing religions and differing sects is that they're different facets that you see the ultimate truth. So uh, that's what I hear. If you worship me, you worship Vishnu. You worship Vishnu, you worship me. You're looking through a different facet of the same uh, unalterable truth. So that makes perfect sense to me. She's sharing her experience of that. And experience is important. And again, it's, it is toxic to try and talk people out of their experience. That's why I do my best. I'm not perfect. But when people come onto the live stream and they give their opinion, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> Freudian slip, when they give their experience, their feeling, when they say honest feeling, uh, I, you know, I can't argue with your feeling because that's your experience. I can't change that. I'm not going to talk you out. I'm not going to shame you out of your experience. An opinion, that's a whole different thing because an opinion is a way of controlling and it's a way of taking dominance, which is what happens whenever I hear the Vishnu worshipers saying that Vishnu is God and Shiva is less than and Shiva, you know, and they make that comparison. When I, you know, I don't, I haven't heard, I'm sure there are Shiva worshipers out there that do the same, but definitely there's a, you know, you don't hear those voices nearly as loudly. So when I read this, according to her, according to the Shiva, the Maha Shiva Purana, Shiva says, those who worship Vishnu worship me, and those who worship me worship Vishnu. He's identifying. He doesn't. He, Vishnu is not the other. It's self-awareness. And Vishnu, make no mistake, is the soul. No two ways about that. And the soul is the star of the show here on earth. No two ways about it. Um, and then uh, this person says, Shiva gave this blessing or boon to Vishnu. So this is, you know, I had mentioned something about, you know, Brahma is not worshipped anymore. And so this person is sharing the mythological understanding through the Purana. Shiva gave this blessing or boon to Vishnu. Now that puts Shiva in a state of power. That Shiva gives a blessing to Vishnu. How dare he do that? Shiva can't do that. But according to, to this, uh, he did. According to this uh, scripture, he did. As a result, Shiva cursed Brahma stating that the worship of Brahma would cease in India and that Vishnu would be the most worshipped deity in the Hindu pantheon. And to this day, there is only one temple for worshipping Brahma. Pretty interesting. So 
I'm remembering now the, uh, the myth in question. So in this mythological understanding, um, Shiva is this light, this, this light. And when you look at it, you see this, this light that goes up, you know, for seemingly forever. And if you look down, seemingly forever. And so Brahma and Vishnu are sitting there looking at the light and um, they made the decision, okay, Brahma, you go down and see how far it goes down and let me know if you find an end. I'm going to go up and see if I find an end. In other words, Shiva is infinite consciousness. And they're going to find out, you know, it looks infinite, but let's find out if he goes to the highest heights and down to the lowest depths. Let's find out. So Brahma goes racing down and Vishnu goes racing up and then they come back and Vishnu says, yeah, I, I couldn't find an end. And Brahma said, yeah, I found it. I found the end. And Vishnu knew he was lying. So he said, because you're lying, there is no end. There is no end to Shiva. He goes in infinitely in both directions. And so therefore, nobody's going to worship you anymore because of your ego. And Brahma is ego. That's not, you know, we look at it and say, oh, uh, it's, it's not, a, it's, it's a reality because Brahma is creation. It's the Big Bang, which has been now debunked. But that theory of there's an infinite, infinitely small point of infinite density that explodes into creation. That is Brahma. Brahma is seen as the egg of creation. So for Brahma, there has to be a beginning. Because time starts from a beginning, creation comes out of nothing from a beginning. So it's literally impossible for Brahma to conceive of an infinite beginning. You know, if going up represents going forward in time and expansion into infinity, that's easier to comprehend than, I mean, there was no beginning? I can't comprehend that. So whether or not, you know, we could make the argument about was Brahma lying or not, you know, for him, there has to be a beginning. There has to be, you know, when I go down and follow Shiva, there has to be a point where he started. There has to be, because that's my experience. I'm Brahma. I don't know. You know, there's no other way to see things. So Vishnu doesn't have to have that experience because Vishnu is uh, another uh, experience of infinity. And he creates infinity from our perspective, infinite, you know, existence, infinite protection in, you know, the, he creates the space for you to exist. So there's that infinity as well. So uh, Vishnu says, no, you're lying. And because of your ego, be your limited understanding, we won't worship you anymore. And we could make arguments about the uh, beginnings of the Vedic, you know, in the beginning of the Vedic uh, religion, they had to worship Brahma. Brahma used to be God, you know, and, and then, you know, uh, and, and then it was Indra, if we're being honest. Indra became the God. Like if there was the closest thing to, you know, Jehovah, it would have been Indra. And Indra has been relegated to a demigod now. So she says, when I had read the Mahashiva Purana, Shiva said, those who worship Vishnu worship me, and those who worship me worship, worship Vishnu. Shiva gave this blessing or boon to Vishnu as a result of Brahma trying to usurp all of the worship for himself. As a result, Shiva cursed Brahma, stating that the worship of him would cease in India and that Vishnu would be the most worshipped deity in the Hindu pantheon. You take it this because Vishnu saw that Shiva was infinite. Because Vishnu saw that Shiva was infinite, therefore he gets all of the praise. So it sort of changes it. You know, he's, he's the greatest devotee of, of Shiva. Now, Vaishnavites can't tolerate that. Uh, uh, Sh uh, Shiva worshippers can tolerate Shiva being the greatest devotee of Vishnu. They, they don't have a problem with that. Uh, uh, Hanuman. Hanuman isn't an avatar of, of Shiva because for reasons I don't quite understand, um, Shiva does not incarnate in human flesh. But he has these rays of his, you know, of his awareness that can incarnate in uh, deities. And um, Hanuman is one of them. So Hanuman is Shiva. And when you, if you know anything about Hanuman, there's that very famous, you see these pictures of Hanuman, probably the most famous one. He's sticking his, his claws into his chest and he's tearing open his chest and revealing that he has no heart 
but his heart is Rama, which is Shiva, uh, excuse me, which is Vishnu. So he says the heart of Shiva is Vishnu and his whole purpose of uh, Hanuman's purpose is to serve the soul, to serve Vishnu, to serve Rama, the king, the soul. Um, so Shiva worshippers don't have an ego issue about that. They'll say that, no, Shiva is the ultimate devotee of Vishnu. And they go, I know, that's, that's true. Jaya Hanuman. Um, so, all right, so then we get a reply. We get a reply from somebody who shall remain nameless. I'm trying not to, to point fingers at people. But again, you know, you come onto my channel and you're going to have a, a self-righteous opinion about something. Not that you're really self-righteous, but you definitely have a viewpoint that I think is worth analyzing. So in response to this person's um, experience of reading the Mahashiva Purana, this person starts off and says, this simply is not the Vedic position. Now, let's just start there. This is simply not the Vedic position. That is true. So there's nothing untrue about that statement, but it is a loaded statement. And I want to take a look at that. The term Vedic has a lot of loaded power in it. And so right there, without saying anything, there's whole volumes of saying the Upanishads and the Puranas, those aren't true scripture because they didn't come first. The true scripture is the Vedas. So this is simply is not the Vedic position is another way of saying, even though you're not saying it outright, it's another way of saying this isn't the true scriptural position. And it's, it's very reminiscent of uh, Christianity where, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible is the word of God. Oh, that was written some by some other. No, that, that's not. The Bible is the, the Vedas are the only word of God. And not only that, but my interpretation of the Vedas is the truth. Now, whether you realize it or not, that assumption is in that first sentence and it, it, it creates the tone for the rest of it. If I let that pass without examining it, I have now allowed you to shove your assumption, perhaps an unconscious assumption, down everybody's throat. This is how, by the way, how Christians win arguments. When you're, when a Christian or a, whoever it is, a, you know, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, born again Christian, I don't care who it is. When these Abrahamic monotheists sh uh, sh uh, show up at your door and they knock on your door and they want to talk about God. This is why I never even bother talking with them. They're going to be, I want to talk to you about, sorry, no religion. Leave me alone. I don't even bother because they're going to shove an assumption down my throat and I don't have time to correct them on all of their assumptions, their unconscious assumptions, because they have such an emotional attachment to it, such an unconscious, fear-based emotional attachment. Um, if it's not fear-based, in this case, I don't think this is a fear-based emotional attachment. I think it is a narcissistic, unconscious emotional attachment because people who are, it makes perfect sense. What, is, what does Vishnu do? He protects human beings. He protects human beings from fearful things in physical life. Let's be clear about that. The avatars of Vishnu are about preserving human limited life in your physical body. That's why people love him the most, because most people are attached to their physical lives. So the reason why they get uh, threatened by anything else is because they're attached. It's an unconscious, fear-based, emotional, we could say childish agenda about being physically safe. And they're going to spiritualize that. Um, so there's a possibility that could be in this first statement. But if we don't analyze it, 
then what ends up happening, like when the Christian knocks on the door, he's going to talk about God and Jesus. And you're going to say, I don't believe that. And then he's going to draw you into an argument about, you know, it could be, did Jesus rise from the dead? And you're going to say, you know, I, we don't know. He's going to say, no, we do know because the Bible says, and then it becomes this argument about what did that Bible verse mean? This is how it always ends up becoming. And if you don't believe in the Bible, then there's nothing to talk about. But for most people who have, you know, who don't want to look unspiritual, you know, they don't because that's because for remember for, uh, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred years, if you said you didn't believe in the Bible, they killed you for it. So there's a lot of shaming involved in that. So even not, even if somebody's not religious, they're not going to be inclined to say, I don't believe in the Bible, it's just written by humans. People are going to go, no, that's not what it meant. What that what that verse meant was, you know, uh, and so the Christians are always going to be right because they do know the Bible backwards and forwards. And the Christians are correct because the Bible was always meant to be taken literally. When you try and look at it, uh, symbolically they're going to tear you to pieces and they're 100 percent in the right so the only really way to deal with it is just throw the bible out altogether i'm in complete agreement with the christians who say either you take all of it or none of it great i'll take none of it let's just throw it all out so that's what's happening here this simply is not the vedic position in other words if you don't if you don't take my position then you're not truly East Indian indigenous religion, Vedic. This is the true position. You could replace Vedic with true. Veda means wisdom, it means to see, and it means wisdom. So, I mean, there's just so much loaded in that. Now he doesn't say, this simply is not my perception of the scriptural understanding, or this isn't uh, this simply is not the position of many people, uh, you know, who follow Vishnu. He doesn't say that. He doesn't isolate it and give it to certain. He, he, he's coming from absolute truth. And I know he has no realization that that's what he did. But definitely he starts that whole thing out by that. And that means if we don't buy into everything he says, then we don't believe the truth. Now, you know who you are. You didn't realize that's what you did, did you? But you did. You're on my channel. You should know better. So he says, uh, this is simply not the Vedic position. Whilst those who worship Vishnu indirectly worship Shiva, it's not for the reason given in this Purana. According to whom? You're making this statement about truth and according to whom? This is how, this is always, you know, that somebody has an emotional agenda because they don't talk about their experience, they don't talk about their feelings, they shove absolute truths down your throat. And that's what you're doing here. Those who worship Vishnu indirectly worship Shiva, it's not for the reason given in this non-Vedic Purana. According to whom? Vishnu as Brahman, Brahman means God. So what are we doing now? Now another assumption is getting shoved down our throat. Brahman is another word of saying the other, of God, the all, uh, you know, pervasive God. It's a, it's, it's, it's a specific God consciousness phrase. Vishnu as Brahman is the one who empowers the other devas. Worshipping the devas is akin to watering, listen to this, is akin to watering one leaf of a tree whilst worshipping Sriman Narayana, which is Vishnu, is like watering the roots of the tree. Let's have a proper look at the scriptures to clear things up. So we're all screwed up here, man, because we're not seeing it according to the Bible. I mean, the Vedas. So let's clear it up. Because what the Bible says is God's word, not your experience and not your feelings and not your opinion. And certainly what was written down doesn't uh, have the potential to evolve to something beyond what we were capable of. 
So even though the Vedas were the first thing written, um, they are the ultimate truth. You can't evolve beyond them. And of course, the Puranas and the, you know, those other, th they came later. That's all loaded in this. It is, um, it, it's, it's grandiose. It shows tremendous uh, lack of awareness of your own uh, assumptions. If you are aware of your assumptions, you're grandiose about them and you're um, condescending. You know more than other. He's going to educate, uh, educate us on what's really going on here. And what's underneath that is an emotional attachment. Nothing wrong with having an emotional agenda as long as you're aware of it. I have an emotional agenda more towards Shiva because that's my experience. That's what works best for me. But I don't have anything against people who need to do that or want to do that or, you know, whatever floats your boat, man, as long as it's uh, as long as it's not destructive and it's not destructive, even though I've made these judgments about, um, you know, lots of Vishnu worshipers are immature and, uh, you know, working through their childish narcissism. Um, it's not destructive. I mean, I've I've gone to Kirtans and chanted to Krishna and I've had, you know, uh, experiences with tears running down my face and you know, my heart opening up. I've had all of that. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's not ultimately what what works for me. But, you know, don't start telling us how don't start setting us right, because you're not being honest about your emotional attachment. And if this isn't your emotional attachment, why are you defending somebody else's projection? Let's see. Let's keep going. Uh, so the supreme personality of God said, now, I don't know where he said where he gets this from. So he's he's now do you see the first statement. This simply is not the Vedic position. This has now snowballed into um, now I'm just going to openly just shove these assumptions down your throat. The Supreme Personality of the Godhead, meaning Vishnu, said, quote, O Rudra, the mighty armed one, for deluding the enemies of the gods, prepare a course of conduct to be followed by heretics. In other words, uh, because of what you've done, Rudra, you can now... Uh, create a, a path for those who aren't following the truth. Hmm. Oh, best of the gods. So the supreme, which is really the best of the gods, the best of the gods sort of gives to Shiva, well, you're the best of the gods because of what you did for me. Um, oh, best of the gods, narrate to them the Tamasic Puranas, and also please make confusing scriptures. So he says, okay, so this, this is, by the way, not Vedic. I'll finish the whole quote. And then he goes, taking to their dogma, all the ancient demons will be averse to me in a moment without doubt. This is Vishnu talking. In my own in incarnations, avatars as well. Oh, very powerful Rudra, in order to delude the ignorant ones, which he then writes out, Tamasani. So he's focusing on the word Tamas, which we're going to talk about. Um, oh, very powerful Rudra, in order to delude the ignorant ones, the Tamasani, I shall worship you, Yuga after Yuga. After having upheld this dogma, they will fall without doubt. So this has come from the Padma Purana. That's not Vedic either. So what do we have? We have sects now battling each other through different scriptures. If I'm being honest and I'm not an expert in these just by looking at it, what I'm seeing here is that first comes the, the Mahavishnu Purana and somebody who's a worshiper of Vishnu is sharing their experience. When, when Shiva says, when you worship Vishnu, you worship me. And when you worship me, you're worshiping Vishnu. It's just a different uh, facet of the crystal. We're in the same, we're doing the same thing in a different way. And then 
well, they can't tolerate that. So up pops this other Padma Purana, a Vishnu Purana, where Vishnu is going to say, hey, uh, Rudra, Shiva, you know, and by the way, using the name Rudra, that's a Vedic term that, that sort of lessens Shiva even more by calling him Rudra in the context of, well, that's what they called him in the Vedas. He wasn't really God. He was just sort of this, this storm God. He wasn't like you see him now. Um, and of course, what I'm going to do is you're going to delude people so that I can then become an avatar and show the real truth. And I'm going to, people are going to worship you because what really needs to happen is they need to worship me. And so to me, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like that, uh, you know, Shiva, the Mahashiva uh, Purana was written that, that was a burr in the side of other people because how dare they equate Shiva and Vishnu together. And so we're going to write another one and we're going to badmouth and we're going to gaslight you. Oh, you worship Shiva? Well, of course, that's, you know, Vishnu was gaslighting you. That's what I see when I read that. And so he's, this isn't accurate. You say, let's look at the scriptures to clear this up. Which scriptures? You're not being honest about your personal, unconscious, emotional attachment. And that's a far better discussion for you than to gaslight us this way in this grandiose, condescending way. Um, anyway, so he says, now we have two Puranas that are seemingly contradictory, but fortunately we all know that Shruti, wisdom, um, that Shruti is greater than Smriti. So let's look at the Samhitas for clarification. We'll use the Rig Veda because it's considered the old. So here he is. He's laying down the, you know, the here's the assumption you need to buy into. We'll use the Rig Veda because it's considered to be the oldest of the Vedas. And thus, people, it'll make clear us the most authentic Vedic position. I mean, now you're just completely gone. Now you've completely dropped the crystal and you are now... Uh, grandiosely making yourself Pope of the world and you've decided, you know, so I don't have to buy into that. I don't have to buy into that there is one scripture that's going to uh, prove it because now we're in the realm of Abrahamic monotheist. There is only one word of God and anything that's not in the Bible is not the word of God and um, doesn't give any room for any difference of understanding and let's be clear the purana I, I can't talk about so much the puranas and the samhitas and all that other stuff but the vedas are definitely not a uh, two-dimensional true or false um, seemingly literal account of history or of the gods it is mythology and mythology, especially the further you go back in time, mythology is never taken as um, dualistic truth versus false. It's never seen as historical um, dualistic truth. Never, ever has it ever been. And anybody who reads any mythology that way is not going to understand what's going on in the slightest. So what you're doing now, you've set yourself up and you've given this argument that so the Vedas are the inalterable word of God. So let me give you my literal dualistic interpretation of that so that then I'll tell you what the actual truth is. You may not know that that's what you're doing. I mean, maybe you were taught this, you've been following some path and maybe that's how it was taught to you and you think that that gives it some validity. Again, the whole idea of syncretism is that we evolve. My, what I'm teaching now is not something they would have taught 2,000 years ago. But it doesn't mean that I'm not expanding on that, which is, I think I am. And I think that the, you know, the, the Mahavishnu Purana, I think that that was an expansion. It's a different facet. It, it, it addresses a different need. It addresses a different soul experience. So stop shoving things down our throats. I'm going to give you my understanding. I haven't even read this quote yet, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to poke holes in your, you know, authoritarian Pope-like view of here's the truth. 
So he says, now we have two Puranas that are seemingly contradictory, but fortunately we know blah, 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 blah. We'll use the Rig Veda because it's considered to be the oldest of the Vedas, and thus, people, it'll make clear to us the most authentic ancient Vedic position on the matter. He has to use authentic and ancient in the same word. Again, loaded. We're loading it up to then shame you out of if you don't agree with it. Um, quote, O oh, you who wish to gain realization of the supreme truth, utter the name of Vishnu at least once in the steadfast faith that it will lead you to such realization. There is nothing in that quote that says anything about Shiva not being the same. There, you could replace the word uh, Vishnu with Shiva. And it would still be true. Are you going to tell me that it's untrue? Oh, you who wish to gain realization of the supreme truth, utter the name of Shiva at least once in the steadfast faith that it will lead you to such realization. Are you going to tell me that that won't work? No, it only works if you say Vishnu. I mean like Jesus. Unless you confess to believing in Jesus, you won't go to heaven. You'll die in hell. Is that what you're saying? That That is, this is how we get, how assumptions destroy uh, critical thinking. When is something sometimes true and sometimes false? When is something partially true and partially false? When is something 100% true and 100% false? Is it 100% true that only, and then, then there's no word, it doesn't say, oh, you who wish to gain realization of the supreme truth, only utter the name of Vishnu. It doesn't say that. It says, utter the name of Vishnu. Who's going to argue with that? I'm not going to argue with that. You could uh, put any deity's name in there. You know, oh, you who wish to gain realization of the supreme truth, utter the name of Shiva, utter the name of Brahma, utter the name of Kali, utter the name of Indra. Are you going to tell me that it's, it won't work if you say, oh, you who wish to gain realization of the supreme truth, utter the name of Indra at least once in steadfast faith? that it will lead you to such realization. What's interesting is that it tells you you have to do it in steadfast faith. So the operative phrase here is to utter in steadfast faith that it will lead you to such realization. The opposite seems to be indicated, which is if you do it superficially without steadfast faith, it might not lead you to that realization. How is it you didn't see that? my Vishnu worshiping friend. So that's the Rig Veda 51.15b.3. Then he's going to give us another one. Vishnu is the most ancient of all, yet also the most recent. Nothing and no one creates Vishnu, yet Vishnu creates everyone and everything. Great. Does that mean that Vishnu is the only one? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say Vishnu is the, it says Vishnu is the most ancient and yet the most recent. You can say that about Shiva. Shiva is the most ancient of all, yet the most recent. This is mythology. Mythology is not one or the other. Let me remind you, I've been saying for the longest time, Hindus are the only people who know how to think holographically. You ask them about Ganesha. Is Ganesha real? Oh, yes, Ganesha is very real. Is Ganesha a symbol? Yes, Ganesha is a symbol. Is Ganesha an archetype? Yes, Ganesha is an archetype. Is Ganesha a real person that lives in a specific place? Oh, yeah, you better believe it. Well, you can't be both. Oh, yes, he can. He's, you don't understand. This is how deities work. Is Ganesha, um, does Ganesha have a, an elephant head? Yes. Is the elephant head symbolic? Yes. I mean, no matter what you say to a worshiper, especially of Ganesha, no matter what thing you say, it's going to be true, but it's not going to be true in a linear black and white universe. It's not going to be true in a biblical, literal universe. It's only going to be true in a mythological, mythological universe. So to take that out of context and say, it, is, it doesn't say that Vishnu is the only most ancient of all, and yet the only most recent, it doesn't say that uh, this is only true about Vishnu because it doesn't say uh, all the other gods are created 
you know, it, it, you could say nothing and no one creates Shiva, yet Shiva creates everyone and everything. But Shiva was not a deity that was worshipped. Rudra, uh, Indra, these were worshipped, but Shiva had not erupted into the mind of the Vedic Hindus yet. So, of course, he's not listed there. But this idea, you know, again, when is something 100% uh, true and 100% false? Does this pertain to any other deity? We have to say yes. There's no way you can say no. And if you do, then I, then that's great for you. If Vishnu is the only one for you, then by all means do it. But that verse doesn't say that. It's just talking about the nature of divinity in general. And then uh, another one, quote, Vishnu is glorified because of who and what he intrinsically is. So does that mean Shiva is not glorified because of who and what he intrinsically is? Does that mean that Surya is not glorified because of, it doesn't, doesn't exclude that statement on any other deity. Except now there is this, if I take this to be true, Indra, on the other hand, is only glorious circumstantially. So why is that not a put down? That sounds like a put down, doesn't it? Well, Vishnu is glorified because of who and what he is intrinsically. Indra, on the other hand, is glorious circumstantially. Indra is a god of action. Indra is the conqueror. Indra gets his power from throwing down the lightning bolt and destroying Vritra, the encircling uh, uh, serpent who chokes off the lifeblood of the world. That's what he does. Does that mean that it's wrong? So while you're glorifying Vishnu and Vritra is choking you to death, Indra better come along and do something because of his circumstantial actions. Indra takes action in the three-dimensional world. He's a very practical person. Why are we trying to say one is better than the other? We're talking about two different functions. Vishnu represents the soul. Vishnu represents, as you've rightly pointed out, the internal essence of divinity. So he is worshipped for his intrinsic essence because that's what he is limited to. Indra is worshipped for what he does, and without Indra... There would be no lightning which would not destroy the false ego. So do you see how your, your projection, your assumption, which you laid out in the beginning, is now completely the filter through which you see everything? There's no critical thinking going on here. When is something 100% true and 100% false? When is something partially true and partially false? And again, you're only giving us bits and pieces. There's no doubt in my mind if I were, which I'm not, if I were an expert on the Rig Veda, I would be able to pull out other, you know, isolated quotes to completely destroy whatever you're trying to say. But all I need is just critical thinking to show that you have an unconscious emotional bias. And that's why you needed to devalue somebody else's experience of the Mahashiva Purana, which is not a threat to your belief in Vishnu or anybody else's, unless you are insecure and you need your interpretation to be the truth. And then you're going to see your own scriptures the way you need to see it. All right, let's keep going. So now he's going to shove some things down our throats. Vishnu is Param Atman, the super soul, the supreme self that resides within each Atman. So he's talking about within the soul is the oversoul, which is Vishnu. Totally in agreement right there. That doesn't negate anything or anybody else. That is true. This is mentioned within the Mukanda Upanishad with the example of the two birds seating on a branch. See, now here's going to get some things shoved down our throat. Shiva is the personification of Atma Tattva, the personification of consciousness, which is why we say Shivoham, I am consciousness. Think about the Trimurti from a very simple logical standpoint. 
you, now you're making values about, okay, I'm going to give you the logical standpoint. So I, let me deign to condescend and give that to you. So let's think about the trimurti from my very simple logical standpoint. As you know, I haven't even read yet. I already know I'm going to be able to slice it to shreds. Vishnu as the sustainer must also be the sustaining, the one sustaining Shiva. Well, I don't know that. That isn't self-evident or in, in any way. That's your two-dimensional. You have to figure things out because you're coming from an emotional attachment that, that Vishnu is everything and Shiva isn't. So since Vishnu is the is the sustainer that he must be sustaining everything else which isn't untrue but it's not uh, it's not singularly exclusively true to anything else we could say that Vishnu is the sustainer of Shiva but without Shiva Vishnu has no consciousness I could very easily use the same kind of logic against you and then I could say and without consciousness you know what good is existence you see how I mean it just depends and I think I just spoke the truth. And even if I just said that, it doesn't diminish Vishnu at all. Because we have three centers. We don't have one center. We don't have two centers. We have three. And it's the unification of these three centers that creates the trimurti. So why are you feeling the need to make one superior to the other? The proof that Shiva worships Vishnu. Because Vishnu must be the focus in physical life. We don't know that in the heavens, uh, Vishnu doesn't get on his knees and worship Shiva. We don't know that. Talk, you're talk, coming from a human perspective. Come on, you need to grow up here a little bit. You need to imply some critical thinking and some self-awareness and some honesty about your own attachment to disbelief. Think about the trimurti from a very simple logical standpoint. Vishnu as a sustainer must also be the one sustaining Shiva. Not necessarily true. If Shiva is dependent upon Vishnu, wait, where, how did you get that? That is a leap. You have now gone from Vishnu is the sustainer, therefore Shiva is dependent. That is, that is a, uh, a conclusion. That is not, that is not self-evident. That is your that is is your assumption and your projection onto it. So now I know you feel dependent. I just saw that. If Shiva is dependent on Vishnu for his very existence, then he cannot possibly be superior to Vishnu. When did superiority come into this? You have to be clear about this. The argument isn't that Shiva is superior to Vishnu. You're making that because of your insecurity. Which is why you worship Vishnu, because Vishnu is about relieving insecurity in human beings. So for you, this is your goal. You must get secure in your own internal essence, like you said, the, you know, the, the, the internal pervading essence. If you're not comfortable in that, then of course, I don't have time to think about Shiva and consciousness. I have to deal with just feeling God conscious. And what is, we, we know that God is a projection of what? You. You worshiping God because you don't love yourself enough yet. When you completely love yourself, there's no need for worshiping anything outside of you. Then you can be Shiva. And, worship, and Shiva does worship the soul. So, uh, there's no critical thinking here. You want to call it logical. It's, it's limited. It's binary. It's uh, black and white. And there's no honest assessment of, you know, from my perspective, I feel the need to sustain my inner essence. And so I can't imagine how Shiva would be superior to that. That would be an accept. I would, I'd be able to, because then I can be there with you and your experience. This person who's to, who you're trying to correct through using the truth of the logic of the scriptures is sharing her experience. And she's not threatening any of this. This is why, again, this is why I think my experience of Vishnu worshipers is they tend to be immature. Dualistic, immature, frightened little kids. And that's why worshiping Krishna or Rama is great. 
because that's what those deities are for, to give you an experience of loving yourself. And then you can go, go past loving the other and you can love yourself. And having God love you, you know, as, the, as one of these gurus said, the more that you love Krishna, he will return that tenfold on you. The um, other uh, assumed uh, uh, aspect of that is if you don't love him, you know, he's not going to love you back. So let's see, um, think of, of so um, his very existence cannot possibly be superior to Vishnu. And nobody's saying that. Shiva has never said that. <laughs> Vishnu's never said that either, by the way. You guys who follow Vishnu say that. Brahman, now again, that's God. So Brahman is the all pervasive God concept, which is, you know, different. There's a lot of argument among, you know, uh, Vedic Hindus about Brahman and, you know, all the different, you know, what does Brahman exist, all that. Again, this is, this is all based on your own looking through whichever part of the crystal you want to look through. Brahman is meant to be karana karanam, the uncaused cause. And now you're going to extrapolate. So that is in and of itself. Brahman is the uncaused cause. Great. By the way, Brahma, Brahman, Brahma is a deity. Brahman is the, you know, the eternal concept. They even make a difference between that. So Brahma is the creator. So for him, you know, the uncaused cause, again, he can't see anything before the cause. He can't see it. So Brahman, the all pervasive uh, divinity, which he is, not saying, but he is equating with Vishnu, which is true. That's not untrue. But again, the emotional attachment is Vishnu is Brahman, the uncaused cause. Therefore, Shiva can't be that because Shiva is different. And Shiva is saying, but I'm not different. But if you worship me, you worship Vishnu. You worship Vishnu, you worship me. We're the same. There's three selves here. You're trying to say that they're different. And that's you saying that. They're not saying that. Um, the, the Vishnu as the soul is the identity as well. So even if Vishnu were to speak, he would be well within his truth to say, I am everything because the ego, the self, the identity experiences itself as everything. And indeed it is. In this human life, your soul is the star of the show. It is your identity. Shiva and your higher self is the servant of the soul. But what does it do? It serves the soul to evolve to the next level. If you ever read any of the mythology about uh, Vishnu incarnating, he has major karma and he must learn from his mistakes. Shiva doesn't. I could say, well, Shiva is superior because he doesn't have to learn from his mistakes. He doesn't have to evolve. He doesn't have to learn by sacrificing his life for other people. He serves that. So do you see what I mean? I mean, we, depending on how we look on it and depending on what our emotional attachment is, and nobody's wrong. Nobody's wrong here. You want to tell me that somebody's right and somebody's wrong, and I want to say, go to church, because that's where they talk like that. Uh, Brahman is meant to be the uncaused cause. If Shiva is Brahman, then he needn't be sustained by Vishnu. How do you know that? If Shiva is the uncaused cause, and he is one and the same with Vishnu, and Vishnu is his essence, while Shiva is his consciousness, as you've laid out, then they do need each other. And they do sustain each other. Consciousness sustains identity. How are you so needy and so insecure in your identity that you can't even tolerate the thought of being dependent on consciousness to keep your, your uh, identity going? There is no truth in what you just said. If Shiva is Brahman, then he needn't be sustained by Vishnu. Not true. If Shiva is Brahman as well, he is the divinity, he is the source of all things, then there's nothing that says he doesn't need to be sustained by Vishnu, nor does it mean that Vishnu does not need to be 
sustained or empowered by Shiva. None of this has, has critical thinking. And, you know, this is why you can read a, a scripture and you have to meditate on it. You have to meditate on what it means, not just make superficial black and white uh, contrary, you know, um, opinions based on your unconscious emotional attachments. Because that's all I see here. And he goes on to say, this is not a slight against Lord Shiva. On the contrary, he is to be worshipped since he is the greatest worshipper of Shiva. Hence why he's always meditating. You don't see the, uh, the condescension in that? I mean, we should. I mean, he's, you know, he is inferior. But, you know, among the inferior, he's the best. So, of course, we should worship him because he's going to teach us how to do that other thing that I think is superior. I mean, there's so much condescension in there. And it is a slight against Lord Shiva. How can you not? Your whole, your whole argument is, is your need to prove that Shiva is inferior. And nobody, neither Vishnu or Shiva, has ever said anything about that. In any of these scriptures, you're taking things out of context and you're making that determination. But that's not in the scriptures themselves. Um, but we should appreciate him in the proper context to get the most out of our sadhana. In other words, if I don't do it the way you tell me, then I'm not going to get the most out of my practice. And let me tell you, let me just destroy that. That is a very destructive message. Because sadhana is discipline. And that's like telling me if I go to the gym and I don't uh, have, you know, Arnold's uh, a picture in my mind that I'm not going to get the most out of my practice. It's just about going and doing the practice. And the universe does not judge you on being perfect. Don't introduce that perfectionism. I have to appreciate him in the proper context. I mean, if I, if I don't do it right, then I'm not going to, you know, the universe isn't going to bless me in my spiritual discipline. The whole point of spiritual discipline, the whole point of it, is to empower our individuation. And what you've just introduced is very codependent. I have to be perfect, just like the other uh, Vishnu, you know, the Krishna guy said, you know, the more that you love Krishna, he'll love you 10 times back, which means, you know, if you don't love him, he won't love you back. So I'm sorry, my friend. The fact, again, on my channel, if you're going to show up with an authoritative view and you're going to smack somebody down or correct them or look down on them or whether you're doing it consciously or unconsciously and I smell in you uh, unconsciousness, I'm going to show it to you. In any case, I don't mean any, I don't mean any harm to anybody. But I strongly, from my perspective, recommend that you think about this. Why is, does it cause you such fear? And the whole idea, I want, your own, your own uh, um, statements, which, by the way, are your interpretation of the scriptures. Um, Shiva, as the sustainer, must also be the, the one sustaining Shiva. If Shiva is dependent on Vishnu, he cannot possibly be superior. But what about them being interdependent? What about Vishnu? being as dependent on Shiva as Shiva is on Vishnu? What about the idea that Vishnu in his role as the intrinsic self isn't conscious of the fact that his consciousness comes from Shiva? Shiva is so humble. I'm just giving you an alternative here. He's so humble that he doesn't need the worship. But Vishnu, because he is the self, he is the identity. He needs attention. He needs that attention being brought on him or he can't do his function. Meditate on that. Meditate on that which does not make you comfortable but makes you uncomfortable. Meditate on those things that make you aware of your insecurities within yourself. I personally don't have uh, an attachment either way. I love Vishnu. I love Brahma. I love Shiva. I love them all. And they all have functions for me in my awareness and my, and I love, I love Shakti. I love Odin. I love, I, I, you know, they all have different functions 
That's not, there's one of the things I learned a long time ago is that in the world of the deities, there is no exclusion. They don't exclude anything or anybody. You know, I'm, you know, ethnically, I'm as white as they get. They don't get any more, you know, Anglo-Saxon than me. Um, but when I play Yoruba African rhythms, the African deities welcome me as their, uh, as their son. They, they see me as a master. When I, when I uh, work with the Chinese deities, I, they bless me with knowledge that my Asian teachers didn't know. So this idea that there is any, you know, one God greater than the other, um, and the need to focus on that is your projection. And I say, meditate on that. And again, I think the logical conclusion of the worship of Krishna or any of the Vishnu is to move on to individuation, which is Shiva. Shiva is individuation. That's my take. I'm happy to be wrong. I, I don't need to be right about that, but that's my experience. And that experience serves me. You can judge it however you want, see it as inferior or whatever, but it serves me. And that's all I care about. Bottom line is, if it works, don't fix it. Whatever works for you. Um, Krishna doesn't work for me. But that doesn't mean it, it's supposed to. It's supposed to work for those who have those issues. I have my own issues. Obviously, mine is individuation. That's a lesson I need to learn. So who better? Who better than, you know, I, 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 worshiping uh, Hanuman? Hanuman is the servant of the soul. He's the servant of Vishnu. But I don't worship Vishnu. I worship Hanuman. So that's obviously my thing, individuation. And that's the, the, you know, you can't get more individuated than that. To be so empowered within yourself that you don't need any of the attention. You're completely devoted to somebody else. You can't get any more individuated than that. So which one is superior? It all depends on which of the, the uh, facets of the crystal you're looking through. All right. So those are my thoughts today. Thank you guys for the, you know, even though I'm coming down on this, you got to know I'm coming from a place of love and I want to help and I want to have the discussion be helpful to everybody. That's my way. I throw up the, I, I give the bitter medicine, but it, it's because I care about you and I love you. And I want everybody to, to have the greatest happiness and fulfillment in whatever way that is for you. So just know that that's where I'm coming from. And I, I encourage you all to leave comments and leave suggestions and leave questions and um, I can make videos about them. And I, I love doing it. And I appreciate all of you for being there and allowing me to do that. Again, all of these things are here. If you want to support the channel, please go here. Uh, any of these will support the channel. And again, uh, the way you support me is by empowering yourself. I guarantee you any of these things that I offer you will empower you. And uh, of course, will support me and what I'm doing. So that's it. I wish you all the best. See you guys all very soon. Take back your soul. This is another transmission from Mahadeva here at ThunderWizard.com headquarters where you find the world's only unified spiritual energy system at ThunderWizard.com. Get ready because here I come.